Composers are the painters of the musical theater writing world. Stephen Sondheim alluded to this fact himself when he was discussing the development process of writing Sunday in the Park with George, but I'll get to that in a minute. Many people think about the creation of musical motif in the musical world of a show as these like mystical, incomprehensible principles that no one could possibly understand. But let's pull back that curtain, shall we? What is a motif? It's a short musical phrase, recurring figure, or sequence of pitches that has some sort of special significance to a character or plot device or emotional tone within the piece. Basically, it's a piece of music that comes back, sometimes altered, sometimes not, that is supposed to relay some sort of information about the story to the audience. This could be super blatant, but it could also be extremely subtle, meant only to be picked up on subconsciously by the audience. Here are two quick and dirty examples that we would all recognize. How about the upward tritone movement in West Side Story? Ooh, that was a bad whistle. Boy, boy, crazy boy. Or Maria. Or what about the bean theme in Into the Woods? Bum, 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 bum. Stay with me, the world is dark. When you're way up high and you look below at the world you've left. Motif. What about the musical world or environment of the show? Well, this is where our painter metaphor comes back in. The musical world is created by the color palette of the musical tones and relationships, and sometimes also the rhythm schemes that a show tends to use to create its musical sound. This may sound vague, but that's mostly because music is a little bit ethereal and difficult to explain in simple terms. Now, when Stephen Sondheim referred to this idea originally in terms of writing Sunday at the Park with George, his first thought was that he was going to give each of the 12 tones a different color, and as he wrote the songs and George was using those colors throughout the show, it would inform how the music was written. This became a little too complex and a little too messy, so he did end up abandoning it, but that painter-composer was an obvious connection for him, and it should be for us as well. But let's look at some practical examples with my original musical about Anne Boleyn, The King's Legacy, to break this all down a little bit more. Let's start with musical worlds. Since the musical is ultimately about the rise and fall of queens, I created a sound palette for all of the music that had to do with the idea of queenship, based around these two chords. From this palette, I was able to create many effects and motifs to use throughout the show and in different ways. Sometimes this will move into a different key center, or the form of the chords will change slightly, or it, it's just about how many of the notes are being used, the registration, lots of things can change here. One song that uses these chords directly is the song I See, sung by Catherine of Aragon. At this point, she is not sure what's going to happen because she sees a little bit of the writing on the wall where Anne Boleyn is concerned, and she's a little bit scared. So we use these same chords, but in a way that sounds kind of fragile, like something might break any moment. Daily I sit and observe. Slightly different use of the same two chords. In the song moment directly after that song, Catherine and Anne have had a kind of tense interaction, and Anne begins to wonder why for the first time she's being targeted but this is where we get the first full direct quote of these two chords at the end of this little reprise of her main character establishment song. It's also where we get this motif that is otherwise used throughout the show as well, built off these chords. She sings at the very end, If I were queen, if I were queen, if I were then we get a, a C minor movement there. But this idea, that's the I will be queen theme. And that comes back throughout the show in different ways. But this is the first time we hear it. There's a delightful musical sequence of scenes and song work called Mistress Anne. It's all about Anne's rise to her queenship, how she courts Henry, and also how she shows who she is as a very strong, intelligent person. So the musical language is actually shifted to a different key here. It's shifted to a key that is quite often related to things that have to do with Anne's rise to her queenship. So we get similar musical language. fun, but still moving back and forth between these generally same two chords. There's a relatively new song in the show called Make It So, which is a little bit of a battering back and forth of Henry between Queen Catherine Aragon and Anne Boleyn. Now the two of them are basically playing an intellectual 
chess match during this song, but the vamp kind of leans into the idea of the two chords without quoting it directly, this. Which just kind of sounds like a resolution until later on we get a couple extra notes in here. It's still based off the same music, but it's kind of hidden and tucked in throughout. Now, Catherine Vergen sings another song at the moment where she realizes that she is done, her queenship is over, and she comes to this moment of uh, sad acceptance. And because of this moment, she focuses instead not on herself, but instead on her daughter, Mary. So we get the same kind of chord basis, but it's moved to a much warmer key. And it has a little bit of a crunchier movement you'll hear in a second here, because she's accepting her loss. We have this feeling. We're just leaning into the dissonance there as she sings. My darling daughter Mary, I hope they treat you well. I've grown a little wary since hearing that you fell ill in November. Mary, It's all based on condensing these chords down into something that feels a bit more raw. The act one finale is called At The Rise. Now this is the moment in the story where we see, and <laughs> spoiler alert, actually marry Henry and become queen. So because it's about that upward rise movement, we get that same sort of upward movement feeling of the two chords, again, not in their original key, but in Anne's ascension sort of ideas. And we get this in the vamp here of... <laughs> giving the full idea there, we're just hinting at it because there's so much more to happen in this song. Now the opening of Act 2 is interesting because for the first time we get the opinion of the common people on all the chaos happening at the court and how it jars everybody. Really at this point everyone just wants Henry to have a son so he can stop doing crazy things and divorcing a wife and getting a new one. This hadn't been done before. They're all a little bit saucy so we start kind of in this minor feel. But it's the same key center. But then, because again, we're talking about queens. Ultimately, we're talking about the queens here. So, we get this in the vamp. You know, right there, the whole time. It's right there. Now, I said that that I will be queen theme comes back around, and it does. There's a moment where it's quoted again by Princess Mary, this is Catherine Bergen's daughter, as she is uh, very angry about the death of her mother, and she states that she will indeed be queen. But because she's uh, a little bit more aggressive than Anne was in the earlier moment, it changes just a little bit. She sings. <laughs> I will be queen, because she goes on to sing, it's my right. Again, moving to that C minor movement. Now, Princess Elizabeth, later in the show, she also has this realization that she will be queen, but she doesn't state it in a way of it's her entitled right, but instead, she's kind of surprised by the idea. She's taken aback. Now, this is also set in the key of Anne's ascension, kind of tying her mother to her a little bit more, but still based off the same chords. I will be queen, slightly altered, someday. Okay. And the last direct quote of this musical world for queenship happens when Anne is being sent off to die. Spoiler alert, she gets beheaded. On her way there, this song happens. It's called The Queen of England, and it's based off this. I did it, father. Haven't you seen? stripped down version of these chords, right? You didn't bother to congratulate your queen. Watch as your daughter, we change it, is sent now to slaughter. And eventually what we get here is a movement that takes us to, you guessed it, C minor. Now Henry's themes are based off of related music, but it's a little bit different. There's no lift to the sixth here, it's always to the fifth. And sometimes it's even from the fifth back down to the tritone feeling. You get a sense of that immediately in his character establishment song called Legacy. This song takes place in the key of the two chords, but it has a different sound to it. This is the vamp. Get that fifth right away, down into that tritone. And then, his melody starts with the fifth jump. A man is made of flesh and bone. 
da da. Even though this song takes place in A flat, it really ends on a triumphant E flat major, which is tied to Elizabeth's key, but we'll get there later. Once Anne and Henry are courting, they are thinking through different things to see if this is something they want to actually pursue. And Henry's melody here again has the same fifth movement. A man should be able, da da, because he's not evolving. He's not really changing. Anne's thought process is growing and changing and evolving, so her melodies grow and change and evolve. Henry, on the other hand, is pretty static. Another example of this is his outburst song called Patience. There's this kind of dark quality, this all I hear every day. Henry, patience. Now that does go up and up and up throughout the song as he builds in his rage, but still that ge generally same idea of the fifth upward movement and I just want to point out here that the word is patience. So the emphasis is on the lower note, grounding us always back down. Henry never moves up, he never evolves. In fact, right before Anne Boleyn is about to die, we see how much he didn't evolve because he actually gives a reprise of his first song. Nothing here has shifted. And we also take the opportunity for the title song of the show, The King's Legacy. It's a comedy song that his friends are singing kind of to make fun of Henry a little bit, and it starts with his same melody from his character establishment song. You're gonna hear that. Again, that fifth movement. For 20 years we sat and watched. It's basically the same melody, just set in a comedy song instead. Now I mentioned the descending use of the tritone from Henry to show when he's being particularly dangerous. Anne actually gets the tritone as well, but in more of a Lydian sort of feel, and it's usually when she's about to do something that is a little bit risky on her rise upward, and it's even in her character establishment song. Anne sings this, I'll make my own tomorrow. got that Lydian feel to it, but it's still a tritone. It makes us wonder, is she doing something a little dangerous here? The tritone is also built into the B section of this song, My Own Tomorrow, which comes back again and again and again throughout the show as she does things that are a little too risky and are actually hurting her a little bit, but that's just for me. That's just for fun. You're not supposed to know that. Now, I also mentioned Elizabeth's key before. Elizabeth is the product of Anne and Henry's marriage, yes, but Elizabeth is also the true legacy of both Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII. So, they have related musical colors, all of these characters. Elizabeth's colors are in E flat and F, a slightly brighter sound than that darker A flat, B flat movement, or even the C minor that we get from the other character movements. And the setting of these chords feels more ascending, it feels brighter, it feels lighter, and we get it throughout the show. Our first quote of this is during her character establishment song when she's still a little kid. We get this. This. E flat and then F over the E flat and then it will evolve and change from there. In fact, it's kind of tucked in everywhere throughout the show. It's in a lot of music that is underneath dialogue, especially when it's talking about things that are ultimately going to result in Elizabeth becoming queen and the legacy of both Henry and Anne. There is one other specific example that I do want to point out though, which is the song A Tudor Rose. Now technically this is in B flat, but you get a lot of E flat tones in here. And this is when Elizabeth has just been born and is singing about her future as queen as she holds her newborn. But the reason I'm coming back to this is because we also get the I will be queen theme, but it is changed a little bit, almost reversed, and it feels like it's ascending upward and staying there instead of ascending and falling back down. Mom comes back down. However, when it comes to Elizabeth, Elizabeth is the legacy. She succeeded. She rose and she stayed there. So, when we get the actual hook of the song, we have cheeks like a Tudor rose. If we were to reverse the theme, right, but I just put the C as the, fir as the first note there. A Tudor rose. And the high note, that last note of the hook is rose. Because who rises? 
Elizabeth. And really, that's just an overview of all of this. There's more minutia around the color palettes and the keying changes and all these things and how they relate to one another, but that took a lot of time for me to figure out and took me homing in on the specific sound of this show over years and years of writing and rewriting. And do I expect anyone to pick up on this as they listen? No, certainly not directly, maybe subconsciously. All of this seeps into the audience's ears and registers subconsciously for them, which makes it a wonderful storytelling tool, very similar to the way that rhyme and scansion work in musical theater. And if you want to learn more about those, then you should watch this video next. Otherwise... Thank you all for being here with me today, and I'll see you again soon. Cheers! Is the King's Legacy. And that's the King's Legacy.